focus on here for just a moment is going to be my search. This is where you would want to be if you want to think about farming a subdivision, for example, or farming any area for that matter, not just a subdivision. We're going to do an example based on a, on a subdivision. You can set up saved searches. So after we run this search, for example, I'll show you how we can save it. It's important to know, to have in mind the area that you want to search or, you know, your target audience, I guess is the best way to put that. You want to have your target audience in mind and maybe even write it out on paper because it will help you set up the attributes. Now, realist refers to your search criteria. We refer to it as search criteria and matrix. Realist refers to them, uh, the search criteria as attributes. So you might want to uh, write down that information for your target audience because that's going to determine the fields or the attributes that you want to add to your search form. If we're going to do an example search is if we're going to farm a subdivision on customized search because this is where you're going to find a list of all of the attributes that you want to add for your uh, mailing list for your target audience. So we see we've got all categories and this can be really difficult to look at just because it's got every single thing you can add and typically we, we sort of put things in boxes and and that's great because that's actually what they did for us on the left hand side of the screen over here so we can decide for example uh, do we want the property to be owner occupied or not or you know does it matter so I have selected owner occupied because that's going to be relevant to the search that we're about to do for the farming mailing list that we're about to create. You can just see the other items you can add um, geography. So th this is all about what what search criteria just so that we're using the same language we're used to using. What search criteria do we want to include in our default search form? So that once we add that, it, it will pop over here, as you can see, and it'll stay here. Now you can see right here, you can add up to 30 criteria or attributes, as they're called here, to your, what will become your default search form. You've got characteristics that you can add to the property. Uh, you've got uh, listing information. So this can be relevant sometimes sometimes not it just depends on what you're doing assessment and tax information then we've got sales information this is going to give us the last time the, the listing sold this is going to give us what it sold for um, if you are want to come in here and do a very specific search for distressed properties then you can come here and you can select whatever choices you choose um, if i select in distressed sales then that would actually also include short sales and then mortgage information. If that matters, you can include the lender name. So I'm just going to go and click apply down here in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. So in my example, I am wanting to target uh, my mailing list to a specific subdivision uh, where there are larger homes that are owner occupied for at least 20 years, 20 years or more, uh, because the thought process is uh, they've had the home for more than 20 years. It's a larger home. Uh, maybe they're empty nesters. Maybe they're ready to downsize. Now I could flip that. I could flip that and I could search for smaller homes, you know, 11, 1200 square foot homes where they've owned their home for maybe at least seven or eight years and now they might be ready to upgrade their home or get a larger home so we can flip that script again these are just examples so uh, that is our example we're looking for a specific subdivision of larger homes homeowner occupied for more than 20 years and so what do we need to do for that well we're already on my search we already have selected uh, the attributes that we need and you know where to find those now 
So we're just going to begin to scroll down. Now you can add the property zip code. Sometimes it's necessary if you, because of, if you're working across multiple counties, sometimes you might have a subdivision or multiple subdivisions that have the same name, uh, but they're actually in different counties. So uh, you might want to include the, the zip code. I don't need to do that for what I'm about to do. And I'm going to, actually, I've got to clear these searches because that was in there from a previous search uh, under subdivision. I am going to select the subdivision that I want to farm. And I'm gonna do fiddlesticks. Always remember to click search. Remember, we're used to typing things in and they kind of auto fill. And if nothing happens, we think it's not pulling anything. You always have to click search. And it pulled in several different fiddlesticks developments. Uh, but what I'm looking for specifically is the country club. So this one says country club subdivision. Uh, this one just says country club. Now, why the difference? It's based on how someone entered uh, the information either in the tax record or in the MLS. Uh, maybe someone added sub to the end of one single listing and that can change everything. So that's why we're gonna include both of them. So we make sure we pull in all of the Fiddlesticks Country Club homes. Now I'm gonna click apply down here in the bottom right-hand corner. And the next thing we wanna do, we're gonna scroll down. Now remember, we said that we're, we're looking for homes that are at least uh, 2,500 square foot. So we're looking for those homes that are larger homes. Now, you sometimes have to change this. So you see building square footage and mine already says is greater than. Sometimes you have to click on that and say is between or is less than. So you'll have to determine that based on your target audience. But in our case, we want it to be greater than 2,500 square feet. Uh, I'm not so worried about the recording date or the year built, um, I'm scrolling past the house number and the street name and the unit and because all of that would be very specific to a listing. But remember, owner occupied, I did select owner occupied and I indicated that yes, I did want uh, these, my, my target list to be occupied by the owner. And now we come to sale date. So just to keep it simple, uh, I'm going to enter 01012001. And then again, you've got is less than, is between, is greater than. So we're going to be going with is less than, is less than January 1st of 2001. Now I could have selected today's date. And we continue to scroll. I think that's all we need to add. If we were looking for foreclosures, because I had this added here, we could say pre-foreclosure auction or bank owned, so we can determine the stage of foreclosure. Or if we're looking for auctions, we could actually search for auctions. So now all I have to do is click search. Awesome, so here we go. It, it, we see that it pulled 81. Now, one thing we wanna be sure of is you'll see these bubbles and this is sold. And that's that's perfectly fine because if you recall, we put in the sale date had to be more than 20 years. In fact, it was a little more than, more than more than 20 years, right? Because it was January 1st of 2001. So the, the red sold ones are okay, but you always wanna scroll and you can use the scroll bar right over here on the right-hand side of the screen. You wanna scroll through here because you'll notice we have a yellow and if I hover over that, there's a pending listing. So I don't want to advertise to that listing. And I'm going to continue to scroll. And there's another pending listing. And you see it's also removing them from my map up here. The purple ones, the purple ones are expired listings. So we could scroll over here and determine when it expired. So it, as you can see, you can scroll over. There's a lot of information there. 
You can customize this table. I'm gonna scroll down through here and just make sure that I'm removing anything that's green, which would be active, or yellow, which would be pending, and also withdrawn listings. I want to remove withdrawn listings. Right down here, you see you have some choices. I could choose to export this and I could customize my export. Now, what that's gonna do is, it's gonna export um, in CSV format, which is compatible. It would open in Excel. If you have Microsoft Excel on your computer, that's how it would open. Um, I could print, I could email, but we are going to print these as labels so that we can market to these homeowners. So clicking on labels, I would select from the list. Now, when you go out and you purchase your labels, even if you don't purchase Avery labels, almost every one that I know of that's out there will say uh, compatible with Avery and it'll give a number. So um, usually it's one of these three. And so you would just pick the, the one that, that you purchased. You can choose things as simple as whether or not you want to use mixed case or all capitals. I prefer mixed case a lot of times. And then we've got, you can choose the address type. So we want to send it to the tax billing address because sometimes these can be owner occupied, but they, this might not be their only home. So we want to make sure that the, this gets to the homeowner. And then any other things you want to add here. I always select eliminate duplicate labels. Um, sometimes, especially when you're searching for distressed properties or in really uh, super affordable neighborhoods, you might find that like the same company or the same person owns multiple properties. So you don't want to print mail to that same person 25 times or whatever. You can include for foreign addresses, uh, which I recommend, and um, show current owner if you like. And since we're looking for owner occupied, that's perfectly fine. You might come in here, you might be advertising to renters, right? And so you would not want to include that. You can also choose to create a custom label. Down here, choose your export options. The export range, one to 79, we have a total of 79. So that's exactly what we need. And now all I have to do is click create and it's opening. I don't know if you guys can see this very well, but it's opening down here in a Word document for me, which I am going to open up for you. And there we go. So there we have our mailing labels. And of course, from here, I would just go to file and select print and select print from here. Of course, you want to make sure everything's set up correctly over here based on your device. And that's it.